I'd like to welcome at this time the High Sheriff of our city and his wife, Mr. Joe Coggle, and also the mayor of a very important borough, the town of Palomina, our brother, Mr. Spence, and his wife. We have apologies from the deputy mayor of our sister, uh, of our city. I must be still suffering from jet lag. Uh, our brother Smith, and also from the Lord Mayor of our city. But I'd like to put on record that the Lord Mayor of our city is going to entertain our overseas guests and the ministers of the church and their wives on Thursday at a city hall banquet. And we're grateful to the Lord Mayor and the city council for doing this for us. I'm sure we'll all fast and pray on Thursday, those of us who are invited to that banquet. Let's stand for a word of prayer. I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take, thank God, he undertakes for me. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You might ask the question, how do you feel on this occasion? I could not tell you nor describe to you the waves of emotion that at this moment are gushing in my heart. Every name of every congregation present today and those because of their location who cannot join us intimate to me and stir my memory of great battles, great hardships, great sacrifices, great seasons of trouble. But praise to the Lord's name, great and abiding victory. This church should not really exist. If the media could have had its way, if the religious establishments could have had it their way, if the political powers could have had their way, we would have been extinguished long ago. And as for Ian Paisley, he is a nobody and a nothing. He has neither talents, nor learning, nor scholarship, nor ability. And therefore, it is not worthy to consider him at all. I'm always glad that my enemies keep me humble. And I'm always glad that that gives the Lord the entire glory. God in the midst of her doth dwell. Nothing shall her remove. To his name be the praise and the glory and the majesty. For the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. When I stood up and crossed our, I announced my text some 40 years ago on St. Patrick's Day, or believe it or not, St. Patrick was a free Presbyterian. Amen. The fourth 
verse of Psalm 112. The 112th Psalm and verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. I couldn't get away from this text. I prepared another sermon entirely, but I had to come back to this text. It's the most appropriate text I could use today. Until the upright there arises light in the darkness. There are four things in this text. We have first of all the anxious. They're defined by the word upright. They're the people that have concern. They're not happy with the darkness. They're not happy with the situation. They have concern of heart and of soul. Secondly, we have the apostasy. The darkness. How deep it is. It was interesting this morning to hear an Irish Presbyterian minister and a priest entirely agreeing that the free Presbyterians are a rotten crowd. <laughs> Why, I say, when I heard both of them, I said if ever there was a need for a free Presbyterian church, it's needed today. Amen. And it was nice to hear an atheist say, I would rather live in a world of young free Presbyterians than in a world of young atheists, for I would know that my car would be stolen and my house wouldn't be broken into. That's a testimony, isn't it? The apostasy, darkness. Then we have the answer in the text. God always has an answer. Thank God he had an answer for my sins. And the answer for my sins was the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And then last of all, we have not only the answer, the light, but we have the action. It's a rising light. Look at it. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Let's look first of all at the anxious. Now there are people today, and they don't care. I'm talking about Christian people, people that profess the name of the Savior. They don't tremble for the ark of God. The burden of the churches is not upon them. The cure of souls is not their concern. They have never heard that cry Watchman, what of the night? In the life and death struggles of the religious world, they want no part. They are at ease in Zion. It is the ease of sleep. And if they are not awakened, it will become to them the sleep of death. The interest of the Savior how it fares with the kingdom of God and the children of God doesn't really concern them. Controversy they shun like a plague. They love the prophets, the false prophets that chant peace, peace when there is no peace. They hate the true prophet that sounds the alarm of war. Gospel work to them must be peaceful. The religious combats, the religious contests, 
the religious confrontations, the religious controversies are only for unscholarly fanatics, they say. Let there be no division. Let's have peace. Let's be tolerant with the enemies of truth. But we're not going to show any tolerance to the defenders of truth. By their actions and words, they show themselves the enemies of Jesus Christ and their antecedence to his commandment. For Christ said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Remember what was said of Christ? And they were the more fierce, saying he stirreth up Jewry, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee unto this place. The upright, who are they? They're the lovers of God. Their interest is God's interest, and they love the things that God loves, and they hate the things that God Almighty hates. They are anxious for the good name of the king, and the things that are set upon the king's heart. They are called upright, because they conform to God's law. They honor his word. They obey his commandments. They are dedicated to do his will. They are grieved with all things contrary to the laws of God. The righteous souls are daily vexed with the filthy conversation of this adulterous generation. They absolutely refuse to conform to a sinful day and a sinful age. Because of the Savior, they can do not else but contend, and contend courageously and sacrificially for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It was as anxious ones and upright ones that we first assembled in Cross Gar 40 years ago on St. Patrick's Day. The religious world sniggered at us. They said, what does this youth of 24 summers think he is doing? What do these elders and people think they are about? What madness is this? Around us, as in Nehemiah's day, the tribes of the Sanballats, the Tobias, the Geshems, the Gashmus, and the Noadias arose. They cried out, What do these feeble folk? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the rubbish where they were burned? And our worst decriers were those who should have been our friends. They suddenly turned upon us and hated us without a cause. The Unitarians in their magazine wrote an, an, uh, an article on the rise of the Ranters' tabernacle in Cross Gar. They prophesied it would soon perish. Well, we all know that the Unitarians are false prophets, and their prophecy, prophecies have come to naught. In fact, in the last census, our members in Northern Ireland were three times more than our Unitarian detractors and indeed larger than all the smaller Presbyterian denominations in our province put together. And I want to say we will go on singing in the face of unbloody Unitarianism. There's power in the blood of the Lamb, and the blood shall never, ever lose its power.
Could I re-emphasize that our righteousness doesn't come of ourselves? We do not claim in and of ourselves a holier than that attitude. No, we are crooked, wretched, undone, law-breaking sinners, guilty, ill-deserving, undeserving, hell-deserving. But we have been made righteous through Christ's precious blood and his imputed perfect righteousness. We have been justified from what the law could not justify us from. With our fathers we maintain justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight. Only, only, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Ours is unashamedly the testimony of Jack the Huckster. I'm only a sinner and nothing at all, but Jesus Christ is my all Amen. in all. The upright are anxious ones. They are filled with godly anxiety for the gospel. They long that Christ might see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. His honor is their chief desire. His exaltation is their goal. May it be true of all of us here that we are those who tremble at the word of God. Like the man in, his, in the days of Ezra who trembled at the commandments of God. So much for the anxious. Let us look at the apostasy, the darkness. Now there is a use of the word darkness in the Bible which has to do with secrecy, the work of concealment. That concealment may be for good or it may be for evil. It is used in many places for good. For example, God is depicted as being concealed in thick darkness. Yet God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But there is a use of the word darkness in the Bible which has to do with the sinister, the work of sin and the work of sin. It is in this sense that my text uses this word. It is in fact the word that describes apostasy, departure from, a turning away from the light. The light of God, the light of the Son of God, the light of the Spirit of God, and the light of the Word of God. The farther you go from light, the darker it becomes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, we read of the hidden things of darkness. We had that in the World Council of Churches recently when they had their con Congress in Canberra and I'm glad that the Free Presbyterian Church was there to lift up the standard and to oppose their apostasy. You will find copies of a special edition of the Protestant Telegraph of the Porch. Pick up a copy. And in the middle page you will read the prayer that they offered at the World Council of Churches. The woman speaker invited her hearers to take off their shoes and dance to prepare the way for the coming of the Spirit. And then she offered a prayer calling on the spirits of the dead to come and help the Holy Ghost. She called on the spirits of the jellyfish, 
that died in the Gulf oil slick. She called on the spirits of the murdered Brazilian rainforest to come. She called in the spirits of Mahatma Gandhi and Joan of Arc and a whole galaxy of sinners and so-called saints and saintesses. The spirit of jelly babies from the Pacific Nuclear Test Zone. The spirit of the Amazon rainforest now being murdered every day. And so on. That, my friend, is apostasy. Yes. Paganism. The hellish deception of satanically inspired Fired religion. Thank God this church has no part nor lot in that. And thank God this church was there to raise its standard against it. And I could read on and on. Homosexuality, a gift of God. That was the literature they celebrated. Lesbian Christian. Groups were there talking about the great fun they had as lesbians. And the Church of Ireland was officially there. And the Methodist Church in Ireland was officially there. And Gordon Gray, the minister down the road here in Lisburn, I think it's first Presbyterian Church, was there as the official photographer. He must have been looking for the spirit of the jelly babies. That is apostasy. That's what we warned about 40 years ago. And they said they were, we were mad. And they said, lock them up in Purdysburg. I think they should lock them up in Purdysburg now. Darkness. In Ephesians 4 and 18, we're told to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And we read of people whose understandings were dark. Such a one was Professor J.E. Davy, principal of the Irish Presbyterian College and moderator of that church. He was the great arch apostle of apostasy. I have one quotation from him here. I'll just read you it is enough. What did he say? He said the Jewish view was that Jesus was the illegitimate son of Joseph and Mary, and I accept that view. Jesus had a downward tendency which our forefathers would call original sin, but which we would call the dregs of evolution. And that view of Christ, as the Reverend James Hunter the minister of North Presbyterian Church said, they made Mary a strumpet and our Lord a bastard. That was officially voted for and today stands in the records of the Irish Presbyterian Church. That's why we are free Presbyterians. That's why. And I'm glad on their program this morning Sunday sequence, better known as Sunday nonsense, they said that J.E. Davy won the heresy trial, but he lost the battle. I'm glad they're admitting it. This church has campaigned fearlessly against apostasy. And as long as I have any say in its leadership, it will continue to do so. Modernism is the devil's most effective weapon. With it, he severs every restraining Caleb cable from the Tower of Faith. With its black mantle, he dims every spiritual light. Modernism is the wild absalom of rebellion. It is the cruel Ahab of selling wickedness. It is a treacherous Jezebel of pagan worship. 
It is Simon the Sorcerer of merchandising the ministry for Gian. It is a scoffing Sanballat and Tobiah, mocking and scoffing at constructive building in the church of Jesus Christ. And so I could go on. Brethren, if there ever was a need for a clear, militant, fighting stand for Jesus Christ, it's today! Yes. And I would call you as free Presbyterians to buckle on your armor. I would call you as free Presbyterians to prepare for the battle of the ages. I hear in the distance the noise of the coming of the Savior. We should have our lamps burning. We should have our loins fastened with the cords of truth and prayer. We should be in the thick of the battle. I don't want to stand and cheer others battling. Give me my sword. Let me into the front line. And let me stand up for Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that I had the privilege to stand before a world forum with the whole world looking on and look the Pope of Rome in the eye and tell him what God Almighty said about him, that he was the Antichrist. I'm glad I had that privilege. And I will continue God being my helper helper to battle against this great apostasy. And could I say to you today, there is only one way to deal with apostasy, and that is to leave it. Yeah. Presbyterian minister said this week, he said, Paisley has done more to stop liberal thought in our church and to hinder the ecumenical movement than anyone inside the church. Even our enemies have to admit that God's way is the effectual way. Oh, I hear people who say we take a great stand inside. If you go into darkness, you'll be like a pit pony. When you come out, you'll be blind. So my friend, we have to do battle in the darkness. What is the answer to this apostasy? Well, there are those who have surrendered before a shot is fired. They tell us that the Bible tells us there's dark days, and therefore there's nothing you can do. It was well for us that Luther didn't accept that, isn't it? In his day, there were no gospel churches across the world. The gospel light had not been entirely extinguished. Persecuted remnants like the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Wycliffeites, and others had held aloft the flickering torch of truth. However, gospel churches across Europe were unknown. But with a heart from which Pope's darkness was expelled, and with lips aglow with the simple message, the just shall live by faith, Luther shook the world. We need our world shaken again. And the message to do it is the message that Luther preached. Soon Europe was lit up. Dark popery received such an exposure that to this very day she has not recovered and never will. A pamphlet was handed to me yesterday, put out by the Church of Rome, saying that their greatest danger is from fundamentalists. My I said hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad I'm among the crowd that's the greatest danger to operate. I'm glad I'm in the right company. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shone into our hearts, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Very humbly, and very reverently today, with deep emotions gushing through my breast and through my heart, I would say, O oh, great God of light, reveal thyself again to this dark world 
shed forth thy glorious beam of glorious light. Dispel the darkness of hell with the light of heaven. Oh, speak that word again. Let there be light. And there was light. It is the first word thou hast recorded in thy word that thou didst speak. Oh, speak it again. Yet again. Yet again. Yet again. O oh God of light, thou light of lights, speak. 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 And I would say, very humbly and reverently, O thou Son of God and God the Son, thou hast declared, I am the light of the world. In thy face we have seen the glory of God, which no man has ever seen before. O uncover thy face to this weeping people today. Thy sorrowing, suffering, scarred, sympathetic, but shining face. Oh, let us learn that all the unknown joys thou givest were bought for us with agonies unknown. There be many that say to us today, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Light of the world, shine forth, shine forth, shine forth. And with reverence I would say this day, O Spirit of God, thou hast produced for us the God of all books, thine own in breathe the word thou hast graven it imperishably and handed it us today the revelation of thy heart it is indeed a lamp to our feet and a light to our path in thy light we have seen light but without thy quickening power the letter killeth O Spirit of God, give thy quickening upon thy word this very day. It is not by might, nor by power, it is by my Spirit, saith the Lord. We know that the flesh profiteth nothing. O mighty Spirit of light, quicken us, quicken us, quicken us. O oh, people of God, sitting in this hall this day, thou art the elect of the Father, thou art the church of the firstborn, thou art the bride of Christ, thou art the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thou hast a solemn commission to fulfill in this world of ours. Your master has told you ye are the light of the world, and he has commanded us to let our light so shine among men that they might see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Thou must not let thy light be hid. This free Presbyterian church must not let its light be hid. We must trim our smoking lamps. We must stoke up the fires we must take up the torch and shed forth our borrowed light. Shed it forth, shed it forth, shed it forth. Lastly and finally, and we'll get some amens for that, amidst the appalling darkness to the upright, there arises a light, action. There's not a doubt about it. People of God today, you can expect the rising light in the darkness. People of God today, you should look for the rising light. 
People of God, today you will certainly see it. Your eyes shall behold it. This is a divine promise confirmed over and over again in human history by the God of history. Who would have thought a handful of people in a little mission hall in a little village never heard of before cross guard county down who would have thought that something was going to happen that was going to affect the whole religious world who would have thought unto the upright there arises light in the darkness in the darkest day of hellish apostasy when it seemed that at long last the obituary notice of truth was written finally, silently, and supernaturally, there came the strong light of God. Nothing can put out God's light. The BBC may try it, but they can't put out God's light. All the powers of darkness may try it. They can't put out God's light. This light will never be put out. We'll be celebrating our anniversaries in heaven eventually. I'll call you to our billionth anniversary in Glory Square someday when we'll tell the archangels about what happened in Cross Gar on St. Patrick's Day. And I believe St. Patrick was a Christian, so we'll make him a special guest of honor on that great occasion. Yes, the light can never be put out. In Eden's garden, when all the fair trees that God had made became as weeping willows, when the glitter had been rubbed off God's creation and the glory had been rubbed off the face of Adam, when the beasts growled and the birds ceased their singing, and when all nature began its groanings, and a darkness like the primeval darkness that was only shattered on creation's first day again pervaded the whole scene. Thank God there arose a light in Eden's darkness. What a light! The light of God, the light of grace, the light of the gospel, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. What a light! It blinded the devil. It brightened dark and Adam. And it blazed more and more until the royal seed was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And angels broke the invisibility of their clothing and appeared among them shouting, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. In Egypt, when the chosen seed, where, is, where it seemed clamped forever in the darkness of slavery, and there was a gloom upon their hearts that they thought they would never see a dawning to, God caused a light to shine in Egyptian darkness, a light that led them to the Passover lamb and the sprinkling of the blood, that led them out of Egypt, that led them across the Red Sea, that led them 40 years in the wilderness, that led them into a land flowing with milk and honey unto the upright. There rises light in the darkness. In a day when they're settled over all the darkness of hell's midnight when an outraged deity decided that he would have to wash and scrub this filthy black earth because of its sin thank god there arose a light in that darkness there arose an ark and in that ark there was safety and there never was any darkness in the ark of God. To Noah there arose a light 
in the darkness. I could go on through Old Testament history and trace the truth of this promise. But there came a day when the proud Caesar of old Rome thought to tighten his grip of darkness forever on the whole world over which he lorded. And while the world groaned under the empire of our iron and its peoples and multitudes neither saw nor expected an event to take place which marked the final doom of the great empires of the Caesars, there was born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. For unto the upright there arises a light in the darkness. When I could go through New Testament history, there was a day when a young man gave testimony to Christ. There was a day when the superintendent of murders took over and caused people to stone that young man to death. And a darkness came down on the new church. But unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. And the man who superintended the murder, Saul of Tarsus, saw that light on the Damascus road and became one of the greatest torch bearers that Christian history has ever witnessed. What a shining light he became. Let me take a quick leap across the centuries. All Europe was once the serf of papal Rome, the papal antichrist, and the darkness of the most hideous idolatry cast its spell upon all Europe. The mesmerism of papal witchcraft caused Europe to worship old cast clouts and rotten rags. And the Pope washed his foot and held out his toe to be kissed. The story is told about the English dog that accompanied the emissaries of Henry VIII to see the Pope when Henry was looking at divorce from Kathleen Catherine of Aragon and the English dog thought that the Pope's toe could do with a bite and the English dog gave it a good bite. Well done English dog. If you were around I would give you a few good doggy biscuits for that job. In the very hell hole of darkness itself in the monastic system which in the dark ages was as dark as the empty rooms of the pit. There was a young man. He had tried all the ritual of Rome and he got himself into greater darkness. But there shone into his heart a light unto the upright. There arises a light in the darkness. And with a hammer and nails, he went forth to hammer down the coffin lid of popery. And today, Popery still reels from those blows of light and truth. Let me take another leap forward in history. When the churches of the Reformation had gone to seed and the pure shining of the gospel had been largely extinguished, when there was cradled in the land of the Reformation, the land of Germany and infidelity, wearing the garb of religion, which spread across the whole world, when from the pulpits which owed their very existence to the light of the pure gospel, there came forth the preaching of another Jesus, another gospel and another spirit, when denomination after denomination and ministerial training college after ministerial training college fell into the hands of ecclesiastical Darwinites, it seemed as if the whole cause of God would go under. But unto the upright there arose a light in the darkness. The fundamentalist wars began. The great champions of the faith appeared upon the scene to challenge this unholy brat of hell. Those, this was so-called modernism and liberal thought. This was not a parochial skirmish, it was a worldwide struggle. 
To those first generation of fundamentalist leaders, we owe a great debt of gratitude. They are too many to name. They were the bearers of the rising light. We are honored today to have you, sir, the son of Dr. Bob Jones, Sr. Your father was one of the first generation of fundamentalist leaders. And he himself led in the van of those early battles. If I might say to you, Dr. Bob, you today are unique, both in your upbringing, in your ministry, and in the fact that you are one of the last remaining links which span the two fundamentalist eras. You saw the first generation, and you've come to see the second generation. I know you don't want to live forever. Please, God, you'll see the third generation. My own father, to whom under God, humanly speaking, I owe my ministry, was one of the first generation fundamentalist leaders in Ulster. He raised the standard of separation. He seceded from the apostate Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland. And in many ways, he walked in loneliness outside the camp of religious establishments. His example has ever been my guiding star. And to many of our ministers who sat under his teaching in the theological hall of our church, they owe to him a debt of gratitude. Other great leaders in Northern Ireland in the battle for orthodoxy were the Reverend James Hunter, minister of North Presbyterian Church, the Reverend W. J. Greer, both of which seceded from the Irish Presbyterian Church to form what was first known as the Irish Evangelical Church and is now the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Dr. Sam Hanna of Berry Street was another great contender, although he did not secede from the assembly. The great evangelist, the Reverend W. P. Nicholson, also made a noble and notable contribution to the fundamentalist onslaught on the apostasy. There was another secession from the Irish Presbyterian Church, which however was to have a special influence in fundamentalist history and in the founding of our own church. The entire session but one, the majority of the church committee, the total staff of the Sunday school teachers withdrew from Ravenhill Presbyterian Congregation when a well-known modernist minister was sent by the then Belfast Presbytery to read their findings against them, to read the findings against them, and in exoneration of their minister, the Reverend John Ross, who was also a prominent champion of orthodoxy. In fact, as I said to Dr. Jones this morning as we passed Ravenhill Presbyterian Church, it was there that his father first preached when he visited Belfast. The session of Ravenhill, who became eventually the session of the Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church, were all accusers of Professor J. E. Davy when he was charged with heresy. It was to that secession congregation I was called and ordained. The Reverend W. J. Greer himself, whom I have just mentioned, preached the ordination sermon. Truly the ways of God are past finding out. But let us come uh, to the date that we have in mind today. In 1949 and in 1950, I was engaged in intense, in intense evangelism. I was seeing great numbers of souls soundly converted to the faith. I was asked by Killalay Street Mission Hall Cross Car to come for a campaign. The committee asked for the use of the church hall of Lasara Presbyterian Church for that campaign. This was unanimously granted, many of the session being members of the Mission Hall Committee. At the last minute, the Down Presbytery met, closed the hall against the gospel campaign, suspending instantly three session members, Hugh James Adams, Cecil Harvey, and George Gibson. William Miss Gamble and William Morrison joined with them in their stand, and all subsequently became the first session of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. 
There was a photograph taken that day when our church was formed. All in that photograph have gone to the glory land. There's only two remaining. The preacher here this morning and our old friend Hugh James Adams. Hugh James is going to come this afternoon and appear with us and we'll look forward to seeing him. A church that closed out the gospel could not be the church of their fathers. That's what the people of Crossgar said. Deeper issues underlay that act. And as the anxious ones mourned the darkness, there arose a light for them. The light that showed the way forward in true Presbyterian tradition. Secession, like as took place in Scotland, in the history of Christ Kirk there. In that stand they were encouraged by their brethren from Ravenhill. Little did we think that the closing of the door and cross star, when the devil thought he had the victory, would open a door never to be closed around the whole world for our people and our testimony. Brethren, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I'll tell you what I have been. I have just been a spectator of God's wonderful grace. Truly the ways of the covenant God of Israel are past finding out. Today in the Irish Republic, in England, in Scotland, in the European continent, in Africa, in Australia, in North America, both Canada and USA, and now in Jamaica. This church is holding up the standard of light, of truth, and of Bible testimony. But while we are free Presbyterians to the bone, the backbone, we are fundamentalists to the heart. We do not believe that we only stand for God. We believe there are others who, although they take a different name and adopt a different church polity, stand for the same great truths. And I welcome the international leaders of fundamentalism to our platform today. And I say to them, we love you. Because when we were lonely and isolated and shunned and rejected, you stretched out your hands and you said, Brethren, we are with you in this battle. And to you especially, Dr. Jones, we would like to respond with a great thank you. I want to finish by saying, Brethren, my message is a message of hope. In my text, there is answered prayer. In my text, there is faith realized. In my text, there is God, there is Christ, there is the Holy Spirit. Thank God there's heaven and there's home. And the best way I could sum up my message is with those great words emblazoned in the Reformation Monument in Calvin's own city of Geneva. After darkness, light, for unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Let us bow our heads. O oh God, our Father, we thank Thee for Thy light, for in Thy light we shall see light. O oh God, take our thanks. This day I thank Thee for what Thou hast done for me. I thank Thee for what Thou hast done for this church. 
And oh God, may its best days still be written up. And when the old Moses goes, bring us some young Joshua that shall bring us into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. God help us and be with us for Jesus' sake. And everybody said,